A very good morning to all attending today's lecture. Let me begin by introducing you to today's speaker, Lieutenant General Shubhroto Shah. in 2018. The General has currently undertaken the duty of Director School of Military Affairs, Strategy and Logistics at the Rashtra Raksha University. He is presently a member of the National Security Advisory Board and was also the Founding Director General of the Society of Indian Defence Manufacturers. General Saha's academic qualifications include a PhD on Irregular Warfare, an MPhil, double masters from the Madras University and the University of Pennsylvania, USA. He is also the only Indian Army officer The last lecture that you all were part of concluded the three-part series of expert lectures on JNK. Today's lecture is going to be an introductory lecture on Punjab and terrorism in Punjab. We are going to cover the aspects of the Sikh na nationalist movement of the 1980s. So part one will basically cover the topography, early history, up to the up to Operation Black Thunder. With this being an intro, I hand over the stage to General Sahab. All yours, sir. Thank you, uh, Gaurav. A very good morning uh, to all of you, and uh, wish you a you are able to partake in all of this you know, more regularly being able to interact amongst each other and of course interact with us and the rest of the faculty here. So a very nice uh, start to the year as far as I'm concerned and hoping that things get better. So today I have uh, chosen to speak to you all on uh, the terrorism in Punjab, which I think is uh, a rather sad, you know, uh, part of our uh, country's uh, history. So, you know, I find at various places in the media and all, uh, a lot of, uh, shall we say, remarks are there, irresponsible remarks are there, some places statements are there, which is, you know, extrapolating whatever we are seeing out of this farm protest and the kind of, uh, you know, uh, noises that we are seeing, especially from uh, some of uh, uh, the people in, uh, in, in uh, Western countries on uh, whatever is happening over there, trying to link it back to that, uh, you know, as I said, sad period of the history. So I thought, let me just cover this in a two-part series. It's not a very long series today. And... Uh, in all probability on next Wednesday again, we will finish off with Punjab so that you know what was the background uh, of all that and that will help you to comprehend whatever you are hearing in the news and so on. Okay, so like always, I will use a PowerPoint so that you are uh, able to understand uh, the whole uh, thing a little better. And like uh, my friend Gaurav said, you are welcome to turn your uh, captions on so that whatever I am speaking... So you're able to see it, uh, the, the whatever I'm speaking, in front of you as well. So, you know, uh, Punjab, as we all know, is one of the most developed and economically progressive states of India. Uh, Sikhs are known for their contribution to public service, particularly in the armed forces. And I say this both prior to independence and, of course, after independence. But Punjab was witness to... I think uh, one of the worst tragedies of partition. Punjab was at the front line of two wars with Pakistan. That is the 1965 and 1971. And uh, as a community, a loyalty to India was never in question. But as I said, that unfortunate period of terror and the counter-terrorist operations
the same mistakes elsewhere. And most importantly, I think it is a lesson, it is instructive on how the domestic politics, politics how that is manipulated by a hostile country to threaten your national integrity. First, the domestic politics of India was manipulated by neighboring Pakistan to threaten the national integrity, India's integrity. And in this, comparatively, I say comparatively, if I have to compare with JNK, Northeast and all, in this comparatively brief period of terrorism that we saw in Punjab, 21,469 lives were lost until uh, the whole thing was defeated in 1993. So let's see, we will try to understand the whole thing with the help of... If you see the slide in front of you, this is a map of Punjab. As you can see, uh, pre-partition or rather during independence, it was Punjab was partitioned between Pakistan and India. And later on in 1966, we will cover that in some detail in a short while. It was further subdivided into the states of Haryana, Himachal Pradesh and so on. So as you can see it, located at the northwest of India, Punjab shares an international boundary. Punjab shares an international boundary with Pakistan, running like this, a distance of 533 kilometers. A distance of 533 kilometers is this international boundary. And the total geographic area of Punjab, as we see it here, measures approximately 50,362 square kilometers. As you can see on the map, to the north of Punjab is Jammu and Kashmir. To its uh, northeast is Himachal Pradesh. To the south are the states of Haryana and Rajasthan. So geographically, as you can see, it's in a very, very strategically important area. A little more of the, of the topography, the Grain of the country is from northeast to southeast. Grain meaning is a slope as a and by and large, it is about 500 meters above the mean sea level uh, on an average. Uh, as you can see, some places it is as low as 180, but that's how approximately uh, it is. Punjab. As you can see on the second slide, which I've just flashed, draws its name from punj, meaning five, ab, meaning water, you can call it rivers. So Punjab, that's how the name Punjab has come. And the five rivers you can see on map are the rivers of Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, and Satlaj rivers. So these are the five rivers which give it the name. Okay. Now, if you go, because of the way the flow of the rivers is, parts of the Punjab state also is sort of, you know, topographically or physically kind of divided. Like you can see here, the area between Bias and between Bias and Sitlaj, uh, Satlaj is called the Dwab. So that means basically Do again meaning Tu, Ab meaning river. So that's how it draws its name of Dwab. And south of Satlaj is called the Malwa Plain here. And by and large in Haryana area, uh, stretching into the Haryana area and this, uh, this side is the Sarhind Plain. So very quickly, Manja, Dwaba, Malwa and the Sarhind Plain. So this is what topography is like. If you look at the political map of Punjab, as I said, it's one of the most, uh, you know, progressive states of the country. Uh, the state capital is in Chandigarh, and uh, there are 22 districts, 22 cities, and 157 towns. Remember, I had
small area. You have 22 districts, 22 cities, and 157 towns. The population is about, uh, and this is 2011 census, is 2.77 crores as per the 2011 census, which roughly is 2.29% of India's population. And the Sikh population is about 1.6 crores. Uh, so that is uh, how uh, the, the, the Punjab current uh, uh, political, you know, uh, map and its uh, distribution looks like. If you go back into the early history, uh, during the era of Mahabharat, that is 800 to 400 BC, Punjab was recognized as Trigartha. It's called Trigartha, ruled by the Katoch. The Indus Valley Civilization, as you can see on your map over here, running like this, the Indus Valley Civilization covered most of Punjab and it included the very well-known city of Harappa. The Vedic Civilization that runs along the Saraswati River that you can see over here and most it covered a, a, a lot, uh, the, the Vedic civilization covered a lot of North India and also included Punjab. The Punjab region, because of multiple factors which you must have understood by now, was persistently invaded or influenced from both the East and the West. So if you see the invasion and influence of the West, And from the eastern side, for the whether invasion or influence, the Gandhara, Nandas, Kushans, Guptas, Gurjara, uh, Pratiharas, and uh, Hindu Shahis. So that's the way this place has had multiple influences, you know, over the years. Uh, Alec you may have heard of Alexander. His invasion uh, was, uh, you know, stopped on... Uh, uh, the eastern limit of that was stopped on the river Indus. So that's where it was. And if you recollect, in one of my earlier presentations, uh, when, I, when I was giving you the, the history of, uh, of, of, of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, that is the time when I, I had mentioned to you uh, how uh, Alexander had written to his uh, mother on the... Uh, thing was stopped. And the Greeks described Punjab, Punjab as Pentapotamia. Pentapotamia meaning an inland delta which is formed by the convergence of five rivers. And if you go by the Zoroastrian text, Punjab is related with the prehistoric Sapt Sindhu, meaning land of seven rivers. So, historically, there is a uh, association of rivers by virtue of its geography in the nomenclature that it's and he was followed by nine gurus in succession so after the tenth guru that is guru gobind singh ji uh, basically the eternal guru's spirit was transferred into the Guru Granth Sahib, you must have heard of, the, 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 the holy book of Sikhism, was transferred into the Guru Granth Sahib, the sacred scripture of Sikhism. Guru Govind Singh had introduced the five Ks, written in the slide in front of you, Kesh, Kangha, Kada, Kachera, and Kirpan. And in, 69, in 1699, 1699, Guru Govind Singh created a militant fraternity. He introduced Panj Pyare, which is again written on the slide in front of you, meaning the trusted five or the beloved five in Anandpur Sahib to motivate the Sikhs to face the Muslim invasion. So that's how, you know, this... Uh, Sikhism evolved, and uh, because of uh, this, uh, you know, initiation of the uh, 
uh, Khalsa, there is a potential divide which is there within uh, the, the, the community itself. Because um, it is a divide between those who have been initiated as Khalsa and those who practice the teachings of the Guru. The Sikh warriors had succeeded in keeping Afghan invaders away between 1747 and 1769. Now, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, he ruled Punjab from 1801 to 1839. This map is taken from Google. So here we are. Maharaj Ranjit Singh ruled from the center at Lahore. Now the domain of uh, the Sikh empire extended from the Khyber Pass here, as you can see on the slide, in the west. And it spread all the way up to the river Satlaj in the east. So Satlaj in the east and Khyber Pass in the west. And uh, to the north, it was from Kashmir and coming down to the Thar Desert in the south. After Maharaj, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, uh, the Sikh state disintegrated primarily because of internecine fighting, matlab, aapsi ladai ke se jo, jo hai, bikhar gaya. so it kind of broke. You may have heard of this term Nihang. Now, Nihang is an order of Sikh warriors whose origin can be found around 1699. The origin of Nihang is found around 1699 with the 10th Guru Go mentioned in a hymn referred as a fearless and unrestrained person, as a fearless and unrestrained person. A few studies trace the source to the younger son of Guru Govind Singh, uh, who was called Fateh Singh, who's believed to have turned up once in Guru Govind Singh Ji's presence, attired, dressed, that means, in a blue chola and a blue turban with a dumela, a piece of cloth forming a plume. Observing uh, Fateh Singh's magnificent performance, uh, uh, sorry, appearance, the Guru... Uh, Also, Nihangs adhere strictly to the code of conduct of the Khalsa. Nihangs do not adhere to an earthly master. Instead of saffron, they host a blue nishan. As you can see, instead of the saffron, they host a blue nishan uh, on top of their shrines. In 1851, Baba Dayaldas founded the Nirankari movement. Now, Nirankar, as the meaning suggests, means formless. It is considered as one of the attributes of God in Sikhism. So, through the were prevalent in the times of Guru Nanak. The Nirankari's focus on the formless attribute of God and spiritual realization through the Guru and the Guru Garan Sahib, the Rankaris emphasize upon a living, enlightened teacher as, in, as, as essential for the realization of God. So if you see, there is a distinction, a fundamental distinction between the Nirankaris and the Nihans. I had said Nihans do not adhere to an earthly master, Whereas the Nirankaris emphasize upon a living, enlightened teacher as essential for the realization of God. Now let's move on to the Akali movement. Revivalist activities of the late 19th century, driven by the Singh Sabha, moved the Sikh community away from the Hindus toward their own distinct rituals and systems culminating in the Akali. Akali means eternal. Culminating in the in uh, the Sikh Gurdwaras Act of 1925, 
as you can see mentioned on your slide over here, and also the establishment of a central Gurdwara management committee for administering all Gurdwaras in the province through Sikhs who are nominated by elections. The income from the Gurdwaras accumulated from routine contribution and donations provided the committee body uh, was also you know, established in the Akali Dal, the, the same political party that we see even now, uh, or meaning eternal party, which over a period of time, because of uh, the, 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 the support from the religious component and the sizable budgets, the Akali Dal gained strength and it started manifesting by coordinating a non-violent agitation for politics. Now we'll move forward to 1966. Post-independence and partition, political parties in Punjab tried to, you know, continue with the same sort of divisive kind of politics highlighting divisions based on communal identity. On 18th September 1966, as shown on the slide in front of you, the Punjab Reorganization Act was passed. So if you see from a map perspective, this is how the map of Punjab has evolved post-partition. Post so you can see Himachal Pradesh used to be a uh, union territory sort of... Uh, Uh, sorry, Patiala and East Punjab uh, State Union, which merged eventually into Punjab in 1966. Once this reorganization was done, uh, the uh, the state of Haryana was formed, and later on, the Madhya Pradesh uh, moved on from an union territory to become a state itself. So this trifurcation that you see was actually the outcome of the Punjabi Subha movement. So effectively, the government created Punjab with a majority Sikh population and Haryana and Himachal Pradesh with a majority Hindu. The restructuring did not succeed in creating the basis for the communal vote as the people thought, because the Akali Dal share continued to remain lower than 30% through the late 60s and 70s. A large cross-section of the Sikh population rejected Akali ideology and their ways of communal mobilization. The Akali Dal could at best form unstable coalition governments in Punjab. Even secular parties striving for popular mandate and trying to gain control over the Shiromani Gurdwara Prabandak Committee that governs the religious affairs of the Sikhs and Gurdwaras. Going forward, let's we move to this uh, movement for Khalistan, how it sort of picks up. Allow me to quote the famous uh, Director General of Police of Punjab, uh, Shri KPS Gill, and this is what uh, KPS Gill had to say. The movement for Khalistan was created out of a pattern of venal politics, of unscrupulous and bloody manipulation, and a brazen jockeying for power that is too well documented to be repeated. This convoluted pattern of politics, of competitive communalism, I mentioned this to you a little while back, both the Akali Dal and Congress produced the larger-than-life image of Mr. Janal Singh Bhindrawale. So now, the Bhindrawale sect draw their nomenclature 
from the village called Bhindra in Punjab. The adherents are pur pur puritanical. They do not consume meat, intoxicants, or even tea. The Bhindrawala sect as such was barely known till the 1970s. It's only in the mid 70s they started rising significantly in public view since they denounced the along with the emergency declared in 1975, there was a massive and ruthless sterilization along with the emergency declared in 1975, there was a massive and ruthless sterilization program which was undertaken by Sri Sanjay Gandhi. Now, this is something which the Bindrawala sect was very vehemently opposed to and that is what gave them prominence and eventually a sort of, you know, political reckoning, reckoning as they grew. Now, later on, uh, the sect confronted the Nirankaris for misrepresenting Sikh teachings. They described the Nirankari's easy way of life as immoral. And the most prominent clash between the Bindrawal and sect and Nirankari's happened on 13th April 1978 on the day of Vesakhi, which is otherwise commemorated as the founding day of the Khalsa. In 1978, the Nirankari sect decided to hold their annual convention event on the Besaki day in Amritsar. Assaulted the convention of the Nirankaris. 13 people died, and uh, including that Fauja Singh. 62 Nirankaris, including their head Baba Gurbachit Singh, were accused of their killings. The trials of the incident in a Haryana court acquitted the Nirankari men on the assertion that they had acted in self-defense. To this, Pindrawala responded by calling this that there would be a fight for justice. Now, Akali Dal was also strongly opposed to the emergency declared by Indra Gandhi. And by doing so, uh, the emergency was opposed by Bhindrawala's sect and politically it was being opposed by the Akali Dal. So because of which some Akali leaders were also arrested during the emergency. And when the Akalis returned to power in 1980 in coalition with Jansang, they came down hard on the Congress. As a counter, uh, let me just re repeat the last bit once again. So when the Akalis returned to power in Punjab in 1980 in coalition with the Jansang, which was also opposed to the emergency, they decided to come down heavily on the Congress. Now, in order to counter this coalition of Jansang and the Akali Dal, the Congress started now propping up Bhindrawale in the elections for the Shiromani that were fielded by Bhindrawale only 4 1. During the general elections of 1980, Bhindrawale had also actively campaigned for the Congress. On 24th April 1980, Baba Gurbachan Singh picture you can see on the slide, the head of the Nirankari sect was killed in Delhi. The FIR included names of many well-known associates of Bhindrawale, but no action was taken against them by the Congress government in the center. On 9th September 1981, Lala Jagat Narayan, you can see his Is the he was the owner of the Hind Samachar Group, publishers of Punjab Kesri, Hind Samachar, and Jagmani. He was shot dead in Jalandhar. 
Now, Lala Jagat Narayan had given evidence in April 1978 that uh, Nirankari clash that I had spoken about to the special commission that was instituted to inquire into the armed attack on the Nirankari convention. He had called the Khalistan movement anti-national. So therefore, this was the retaliation which was done. So the assassination of Lala Jagat Narayan actually deepened the divide between the Hindus and Sikhs in Punjab. By this time, Bhindra Wale was riding a groundswell for religious research. that they were potentially getting outnumbered in Punjab. And that was the outcome of a trend which was resulting from the migration of Sikhs from India abroad and the inbound migration that was happening of labor from other states into Punjab. So there was this perception that the Sikhs would soon get outnumbered in their own state in Punjab. By 1981, Vindra Wale had significant following. He traveled extensively across India, participating in Kirtans. And the Congress. The Akalis tried to create common purpose on the ground that Akali politics is based on the Sikh religion and Vindra Wale was a religious leader. And there is evidence to suggest that Congress support for Bhindra Wale originated in the same period as Zail Singh, the Union Home Minister then, and Sanjay Gandhi apparently concocted the strategy of supporting Bhindra Wale in order to weaken the Akalis. So if you see this political contest between Akali and the Congress resulted in sort of the competitive communalism, the competitive, you know, uh, vying for this religious leader called Janal Singh Pindrawale. So both Congress and the Kalis tried to mobilize uh, support using any means at their disposal, including instigation of religious warfare. Pindrawale was implicated in the assassination of Lala Jagat Narayan, but he managed to flee from his Gurdarshan Prakash at Mehta Chowk, which is about 40 kilometers from Amritsar. Once in his heaven, Bhindrawale made an announcement that even though he was not guilty, he would present himself to the authorities on 20th September 1981 afternoon, after delivering his sermon. So, as you can see, the time and place that he had chosen was done very carefully. 20th September was a Sunday. So it was very easy to collect crowd. Was that time Bhindra Wale's headquarters. It is spread on an eight acre compound surrounded by high walls and barricaded by barbed wire. And almost 3000 policemen with 500 BSF in reserve had cordoned off the Gurdwara uh, from the previous evening, that is, uh, that, that is on the Saturday. Now, thousands of followers were mustered into the area by the supporters of Bhindra Wale. To demonstrate moral support for Bhindra Wale. The Akali Dal Longewal head Harchan Singh, Harchan Singh Longawal, head priest of the Golden Temple, G.S. Ajnoha, president of the SGPC, uh, G.S. Tola, president of Delhi Gurdwara Prabhanda Committee, Santok Singh, and members of Kali Dal Talwandi, all of them were there to come and see him, express solidarity, because he had, he had planned to, you know, offer himself to the police. So after his sermon in the afternoon, at about 2.30 p.m., Bhindra Wale drove to the police camp, which was located about a little more than a kilometer away from the, uh, from the Gurdwara. 
Now, following behind Bhindra Wale, as he was approaching that, were a group of Nihans who with their unsheathed swords, but the talwar nikali hui, with their unsheathed swords and spears, a fire tender were burnt. Initially, the police had no orders to fire. They responded with the mounted police, lathis and so on. After an, about an hour, the orders were issued uh, to the police to fire. And in that firing, 12 civilians were killed and 12, 12 policemen were wounded. On the same day on which Hindrawale was arrested, three terrorists on motorcycles fired indiscriminately in a Jalandhar market. One Hindu was killed and 13 people were injured. On 29 September 1981, five terrorists hijacked this Indian Airlines flight IC-423 to Lahore on its way from Delhi to Srinagar. If you remember when I was covering JNK part two, I had mentioned about hijacking of Indian Airlines aircraft Ganga from uh, traveling from Srinagar to Delhi. It was hijacked to Lahore and here it's the other way around. A flight from Delhi to Srinagar is hijacked to Lahore. <clears throat> the hijackers demanded the release of Janayal Singh Bindrawale. After exactly 25 days in custody, on 15th October 1981, Bindra Wale was freed by the central government and the Home Minister Zail Singh of the Congress told the parliament that there was no proof against Bindra Wale in Sachin Singh, the Nirankari chief and Lala Jagat Narayan stating that the killers merited honor and awards worth their weight in gold. So now, if you see, uh, if you just pause and see, where an extremely motivated militant group of people tried to defend their faith through acts of terrorism. So it's a small, motivated group, militant group, that was trying to defend the faith by acts of terrorism. It was a militant community, as we know, that made instant martyrs of their religious leaders and with an intense history of religious conflict in and reform, both in sectarian and in pursuit of political power. So demand for an independent Sikh state were getting voiced on numerous instances, but this time it was with strong secession. Sign that a population which is so respected for prosperity and progress, how should they regress or fall back to this kind of religious fundamentalism and this kind of violence. Anyway, the Anandpur Sahib resolution that was passed in 1973 was a Kali conference on 28, 29th October 1978. If you see the resolution, the key points are flashed in front of you. In general, it was to propagate the Sikh way of life, remove atheism, atheism and non-Sikh thought. A separate be full and satisfactory, eliminating untouchability social inequities and illiteracy, all the, you know, ills that were otherwise affecting the broader in
management of an all india gurudwara law for more efficient management of religious places and community centers reintegration of historic sikh orders like nirmalas anudasi and banner to achieve uniformity in procedures and even the authority for sending pilgrims to nankana sahib in pakistan should be controlled by this authority politically a uh, political constitution for preeminence of the khalsa was demanded and punjab should include it demanded the areas of ambala sirsa tehsil tohana tehsil ratia block of hisar and six tehsils of gandanagar in rajasthan the government of india's authority as the slide shows is to be limited to only defense foreign affairs railways currency and communication other subjects that were there uh, which you know spoke about punjab's contribution to the government of india's finance and that and they also mentioned things like revert to the traditional recruiting percentage of sikhs in the defense forces of india kirpan should be part of uniforms of sikhs in defense and the right to possess small arms without for khalistan as such was not part of the anandpur sahib resolution as many seem to suggest actually the demand for khalistan was first made at an educational conference in chandigarh in april 1981 in which two ex chief justices were present i couldn't find the picture of narula one was mr narula and other was ex chief justice harman singh one former attorney general sarhadi and couple of uh, leading bankers educationists who were all in attendance Uh, within a month akali dal talwandi reiterated the same demand which was they made in this educational conference in chandigarh in anandpur sahib with a supplementary demand for jama masjid shahi imam was also present during the convention around this time this society in punjab was also transforming rapidly rapid because of multiple reasons one of course by this time the because of this increased wealth from farming people were able to donate much more to the gurudwara because of this increased donation to the gurudwara there was an increase in the wealth of shiromani gurudwara prabandhak committee so on the one hand was this you know sort of uh, financial empowerment of the religion. disposable income that means logon ke jo kharch karne ki kshamta hai wo badh jati badh gayi thi because of this enhanced disposable income consumerism increased that means log jyada kharchne lage log jo hai luxury ke taraf logon ka dhyan jana shuru ho gaya and when consumerism consumerism increased the lifestyle changed and because of the lifestyle change that took place the religious leaders were able to propagate that the religion itself is in danger because of this so if you see the how the increase in wealth starts manifesting uh, in the religious discourse on the one side the religious uh, activity was getting more empowered because of more contributions on the other side what it was doing to the individual's lifestyle what changes it was bringing in that lifestyle was being challenged by this empowered uh, 
uh, empowered uh, religious authority. And along with that, I think there was also this point about the inability to transfer the economic power into political power. Now, why I say this uh, inability is there? Because the urban sick that was getting more and more rich was not able to transfer this power into political power because the political power in Punjab, by and large, was there with the rural sick because the Akali Dal by itself was dominated by the Jat landlords who constituted only about 20% of Punjab's Sikh population, but they were the Jat landlord. And on the other side, uh, the urban Sikh felt sort of marginalized by this high concentration, almost 75% at places, uh, the very high concentration of the Hindu population in the urban areas. So there was a kind of, you know, this uh, triangular divide which was there in the uh, polity of Punjab at that time. The intra-Sikh caste politics also had a major role in exacerbating this, polit this complete uh, politics. And, we, and it was, you know, like it manifested, for example, in the constant fight or vendetta, if you will, which was there between Darbara Singh, the chief minister, who was a Jat, and Jail Singh, the union home minister, who belonged to the Ramgadiya, that is the carpenter community. So Punjab had its, it's not as if they didn't have their... regarding the future of Chandigarh. So basis on the one side were these political divisions, increased wealth. On the other side were the Akalis who were trying to cash on these grievances and launch their own Dharmyud. And initially that Dharmyud did pick up, you know, uh, some pace, some 80,000 Sikhs had quoted arrest. Between 1982 to 1984, uh, a series of negotiations took place between the Indra Gandhi and Akalis, but they all failed because of the deep divisions which was there in the Akali leadership between Badal, Longowal, Tora, and so on. And uh, on the one side, of course, the negotiations were not succeeding. On the other side, because of the division amongst themselves, uh, their hold also started to weaken. And as their hold started to weaken, so in the broader context, if you see, the hold of the moderate Sikh leaders started to become weak. Because the hold of the moderate Sikh leaders started to become weak, so the militant Sikh leaders like Janal Singh Bindrawal and others, they started to fill in that vacuum, saying that militancy is the only way to protect the Sikh interest because political dialogue is not taking us anywhere. So therefore, Vindra Wale became the go-to leader for all Sikh aspirations, leading to demand for greater autonomy for Sikhs. Vindra Wale, as you can see in this picture over here, he seized the Golden Temple. <clears throat> he moved into the Guru Nanak Nivas inside the Golden Temple complex with his followers. Immediately after the arrest of Amrik Singh, uh, the president of the All India Sikh Students Association, I mean, sorry, Federation, who was a close associate of Bindra Wale. And uh, the other person who accompanied him was the widow of Fauja Singh, uh, who was held on, uh, yeah, the, the, this is Amrik Singh, president of the All India Sikh Students Federation. Federation, it should be. And uh, this P.V. Amarjit Kaur, the founder of the Dr. Kalcha. Actually being controlled from the Golden Temple. Now, this, there was some uh, major incident during this period, including an attempt on the life of uh, 
the Chief Minister of Punjab, Darbara Singh. Uh, there were some grenade attacks on a procession during Ram Navami. There were attacks, several of them, on police stations, government offices, and residences. On 25th April 1983, the DIG of, uh, of Punjab Police, of Tar Singh of Twal, was killed at the main entrance of the Golden Temple. So, if you go back to the previous slide, in 1982, he was killed by a lone terrorist who was standing guard at the entrance of the Golden Temple. And this happened just as D.I.G. Atwal stepped out of his car. Now, if you see, all the bodyguards that were there with the D.I.G., including uh, and even the driver, instead of responding to the attacker, instead of responding to that lone terrorist, they decided to flee from there. They, in fact, drove away in the car in which he had come. Moment these people started to run away from there, the Punjab armed police people who were in those static static pickets over there, they also started to run. When these Punjab police chaps who were supposed to be with uh, DIG at Wall, when they started to run away, and the Punjab armed police people from the picket started to flee, so there was panic, and the people also started to police <coughs> started to run. Now. It would be interesting to recall at this time. The Mehta area, when Bhindra Wale had, uh, arrest, uh, was arrested in 1981. If you recall, I had narrated that uh, story of how he went on to, you know, surrender the violence that ensued in which 12 people had died. So, Atwal was the police chief that time. So, this was in many ways uh, a, a sort of, you know, act of retribution or retaliation, call it what you will, against a dedicated and committed police officer who was only discharging his duty. The Akali leaders, they denounced the murder and the violence. to malign the Sikhs. The state government responded by writing to the SGPC or the Siromani Gurudwara Pravanda Committee saying that they should hand over the killer of the DIG. Anyway, very soon thereafter, uh, six, hin six Hindu passengers were disembarked from a bus at Dilwan and shot dead, provoking outrage all over the country. And on the following day, uh, Srimati Indra Gandhi, she decided to dismiss Darbara Singh's government and imposed President's rule in Punjab. Temple. And thereafter, it was almost a regular feature to find somebody tortured, dis dismembered, hacked, packed in gunny bags, appearing in the gutters around the Golden Temple. So, a process of retribution had been set into place by this so-called political and military headquarters of Bhindrawali. So, now the important personalities that took charge over there, there's one Dr. Jagjit Singh Chauhan, self-styled chairman of the National Council of Khalistan, and Balbir Singh Sandhu, the self-styled Secretary General of the National Council of Khalistan, they were both operating from the Guru Nanak Nivas in the Golden Temple premise. The two organized the Golden Temple into a fortified complex. Not only that, they started a Golden Temple radio. Sandhu had even worked out the salient features of Khalistan's constitution. According to him, which he had given out in an interview to some media people, 
the proposed Republic of Khalistan would have a presidential form of government. Islam would be the state religion. The principles of Guru Granth Sahib the Shiromani Akali, Akali Dal would be ruling, would be the political, uh, would be ruling the politics of the state. Non-Sikhs would be guided by the state religion in all matters. Non-Sikhs would be ineligible for higher judicial, administrative, and military positions. Preaching against Sikhism or propagating atheism would be forbidden. The Republic would not be part of any power block and maintain cordial and friendly relations with neighboring countries. So this was the visualization of the Republic of Khalistan given out by uh, Sandhu, as I said, to some media uh, person. Now, some confrontation with the Babar Khalsa and there was one Major General Shabek Singh retired. He fortified the Golden Temple against any attempt to storm the position. Shabek was known for the training that he had given uh, to the Bangladesh Mukti Bainu warriors in 1971. For those of you who are present, uh, on the 16th December event that we had conducted last year, if you recall, Commodore Chaudhary was uh, narrating his story of how they went and attacked the Pakistani naval ships in uh, with limpet mines, had mentioned on about Shavik Singh in his uh, lecture as well. So he was the person who had trained uh, uh, Mukti Bahini warriors, but for different reasons, he was court-martialed and cashiered from the Indian Army uh, sometime in 1976. After that, he had come and joined Mindra Wale, and here he was organizing the Golden Temple for all. From uh, multiple directions. He had sighted snipers in very carefully chosen positions so that they could cover the entrance and the open parikrama, which is there around the, uh, the uh, around the temple, uh, they, they were all covered by snipers and windows were blocked with bricks so that no grenades could be lobbed inside and trucks meant for car seva at the langar were used to bring in weapons and ammunition into the golden temple. Around April 1984, a heliborne raid codenamed Operation Sundown was planned to evict Vindramale and the terrorists from the Golden Temple. It was planned to be executed past midnight to achieve surprise. Some of the commandos had rigged the Golden Temple, posing as pilgrims and journalists. They were planned to sither down from two helicopters and rush for capturing Vindramale. The raiding team would was then supposed to extricate with the help of a ground assault team that was closed into the compact, into the complex and vehicles. The contingency of a firefight with bodyguards and others defending Vindravale was envisaged. The operation was finally aborted because of fear of civilian casualties by Prime Minister Indra Gandhi. On 11th May 1984, a final settlement was offered by Narsimha Rao to Akali Dal on behalf of Mrs. Gandhi. But Vindra Wale, he, he rebuffed it. And finally, on 2nd June, the negotiations failed. So on 3rd June 1984, Prime Minister Operation Blue Star to flush out Vindra Wale and his gang from the Golden Temple. By and large, the Blue Star operation was divided into two parts. One part was Operation Metal, which was limited to the Golden Temple, and the other part was Operation Woodrose, which was launched throughout Punjab. And there was also an adjunct Operation Shock, which was meant to capture suspects from the outskirts of Punjab. 
the Punjab Chandigarh Disturbed Areas Act 1983 was enacted, declaring the areas as disturbed, and Armed Forces Punjab and Chandigarh Act 1983 were also enacted by the Government of India to legally enable the operation. entered the Golden Temple. They were equipped with night vision goggles, steel helmets, bulletproof vest, MP5 submachine guns, and AK-47 rifles. They were trained for room in, in intervention. Immediately on entering the temple, the radio operator, he took a sniper shot. The terrorists followed up with intense LNG firing from behind the temple walls. The special group and the infantry soldiers from the infantry brigade closed in cautiously taking cover from pillar to pillar. Attempts to advance towards the Akal Takht failed due to intense fire covering the open parikrama. Shabek Singh had designed the marble surface put close into the Akal Takht. Uh, now, Major General Brad, the General Officer commanding the operation, recounting the events later stated that Shavik had made it almost impossible for us to enter the Kalkar. We suffered a lot of casualties. An armored personal carrier was employed to move in, but that too was halted by a rocket propulsion. Finally, was taken to employ tanks. Then Brad, recounting, says, when we couldn't physically enter the Akal Takht and time was running short, we couldn't afford for it to be daylight. We couldn't afford to be in a situation where the army has been surrounded outside. At 7.30 a.m. on 5th June, three tanks were employed to bring down the walls of Akal Takht. That was followed up by mopping up for two more days to clear the area. dead bodies of Janal Singh Bidrawale and 35 other terrorists, including Shabek Singh and Amrik Singh, the president of All India Sikh Students Federation, were uh, recovered. The number of deaths reported were 83 and from the army and 492 civilians. Although Blue Star Uh, and other buildings in the temple complex left a very sad impression on the psyche of the people. Operation Woodrose, which was meant to clear terrorists from other Gurdwaras in Punjab, also did more harm than good. The low morale of the Punjab police, mistrust among the forces, and no intelligence sharing led to indiscriminate actions. There was there were deported uh, outside of Punjab and, you know, brought to the Haryana border. Handling of the media provoked much criticism of the government, adding to the exaggerated rumors and propaganda. Alienation of the people reached uh, an, an all-time, uh, you know, uh, high because of this Blue Star and Woodrose and the completely, you know, uh, bossed up information campaign and all kinds of rumors uh, spreading. So, the result of this was a whole lot of youngsters, the youth from Punjab, determined to take revenge, fled across the international border into Pakistan. And on the other side, it was the ISI that was waiting with open arms to receive this youth, train them, and send them back into India. If you recollect from uh, when I had covered the, 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 the history and the unfolding of events in JNK, uh, in 1979, when the Soviet Union had entered Afghanistan and around 75 when Pakistan had started that low level Islam, managing this, you know, 
complete jihad, if you will, in Afghanistan. So there was a steady flow of weapons. There was a steady flow of ammunition and everything else and, and finances to support this movement. So for Pakistan, it was a golden opportunity when the youth from the most progressive state, you know, just kind of landed in their lap, waiting to come back and take revenge against the government of India. So that was, I think, the lowest point in the unfolding. Regards, Bian Singh and Saswan Singh, in an act of revenge against the sacrilege of the Holy Shrine. Soon after Indira Gandhi was pronounced dead, anti-Sikh riots broke out in Delhi and spilled over to various parts in India. In Delhi alone, more than 2,000 people were killed, almost all Sikhs. On the same day, Rajiv Gandhi was sold in as Prime Minister. Soon after Rajiv Gandhi came to power, Government of India initiated negotiations with the Kalis once again, headed by Harchan Singh Longewal, supported by Balwan Singh and Mrs. Barnala. Arjun Singh, who was the governor of uh, Punjab then, was Rajiv Gandhi's chief interlocutor with the Akalis. Arjun Singh was the chief minister in Silenti of Madhya Pradesh when the Akali leaders Longawal, Badal and Tora were detained in the Pachmadi jail in Madhya Pradesh after Blue Star. Arjun Singh had witnessed at very close quarters the transformation in their thought while Badal and Tohra had hardened their position, Longewal was becoming further moderate. So that's how you see between the governor and Longewal, by the governor Arjun Singh by that time and Longewal, they were able to, you know, develop uh, this uh, reconciliation process. And eventually on 9th, uh, so, so in response for uh, in response to Rajiv Gandhi's appeal for peace and reconciliation, uh, reconciliation which was delivered by Arjun Singh on 2nd July, Longewal did some political maneuvering. And on 9th July 1985, he called for a convention of all former MPs, MLAs, office bearers, and Jathidars at Anandpur Sahib. Longewal called for resumption of the Dharam Youth. Rajasthan of the Pradesh, he made it apparent that on the one side he was trying to consolidate political power in Punjab, on the other side he was contem contemplating a resolution within the constitution's framework. Now, to keep uh, the possibility open, the Senate Extended. As requested by the Akalis, the scope of the judicial inquiry set up from Delhi uh, for the Delhi anti Sikh riots was extended to other parts of the country as well, and rehabilitation of Sikh deserters from the army was resorted to. The central government also started negotiations with the All India Sikh Students Federation, and eventually on 24th July 1985, the Rajiv Longewal Accord was signed. The government agreed to most of the demands of Shirmani Akalidal. The Akalis acceded to abandoning their agitation. Some orthodox Sikh leaders of Punjab and Haryana were opposed to the accord, thus inhibiting the fulfillment of the promises. And sadly so, on 21st August 1985, Harchan Singh Longewal was assassinated by terrorists. After this, Oh, no, under the shadow of all this, despite the personal threat to candidates, the number of contenders rose to its highest, almost 863, passing the earlier high of 17, 722 in 1980. Four candidates, uh, Lalit Makan, Longawal, BK Kullar, and Arjun Das, were assassinated. Kalis came to power, winning 73 out of 117 seats, and Barnala was appointed the chief minister. The Barnala government started by releasing over 2,000 terrorists under detention, 1,500 
suspected released earlier. Another 2,000 released now, based on recommendations of one of the committees called Baines Committee. The sudden return of terrorists with a sense of <coughs> impunity, you know, Through the year, 63 civilians and 8 police personnel were killed. In 1986, in the first quarter itself, 102 civilians and 10 police personnel were killed. On 22nd January 1986, control of the Golden Temple was returned to the Akali-controlled SGPC. Within no time, terrorists headed by Damdam, Damdami Taksal secured full control. And by 29th April, that is uh, of 1996, that's about in four months' time, the Panthik Committee constituted to organize on 13th April 1986, Operation Black Thunder 1 was launched by the government with Punjab police supported by NSG. The operation turned out to be bogus. Uh, search because sufficient early warning appeared to have been given to the terrorists to flee from there. Banala's decision to confront the terrorists was, however, enough reason to provoke a split in the Akali Dal, and Banala's position became tenuous as his government's survival became contingent on Congress backing. A weak and directionless government kept losing control of the security situation and the arc of terrorism, it expanded from the border areas, that is the Gurdaspur, Amritsar and Firozpur, to come into the depth areas as well, like Jalandhar, Koshyarpur, Firozpur and Ludhiana. In Banala's just more than 19 months tenure, Black Thunder 2. Now, Operation Black Thunder 2, comparatively, was done on the basis of very well rehearsed, a very well planned uh, scheme of actions with lessons drawn both from Blue Star and News. People who are detained in Jodhpur were freed as a goodwill gesture. They just moved into the Golden Temple and Jaspir Singh Rode was appointed as Jathidar of Akhal Takht, the head priest. Inside the Golden Temple, fortifications were made once again. And outside the temple, violence touched absolutely unprecedented levels. So finally, the government decided to act. And we had Black Thunder 2 from 11th to 18th May 1988, which was launched primarily by the NSG, the lessons learned and the training. So NSG had planned, trained and wrecked the objective dressed in CRPF uniforms from the brickets which surround the temple complex. The videos from the Blue Star and the Black Thunder One were utilized in developing mock-ups and train around uh, NSG training facilities which are there close to the national capital and all kinds of telescopic sites giving 1,000 yards accuracy, passive night vision devices, they were all provided to the uh, NSG to carry out this operation, including some ferreting ammunition, that means just by causing irritation, things like improvised mocktail, Molotov cocktails, etc. They were all provided. On 12th May, a DIG of CRPF, Sarabdi Singh Birk, was shot at by terrorists in the Golden Temple. So that gave the government the reason to finally go in for Black Thunder 2. The Indian Air, Air Force uh, flew in thousands of NSG commandos to Amritsar. The snipers took up positions and uh, slowly the, <coughs> uh, they were able to dominate the complete Golden Temple complex. Uh, the first person to be shot by the NSG snipers was Jagir Singh, the Panthik 
committee spokesperson, and after. from the tires, but they were forced to take cover by accurate sniper fire against all these stars and other commanders who were firing from pickets. The Ramgadia Bunga, which had taken a heavy toll in Blue Star, uh, needed skillful handling. It comprised of two towers through a labyrinth base basement. Into which 84mm uh, high explosive anti-tank rounds were fired. So by some very precise firing, they were able to bring down these, you know, vulnerable spots. So ultimately, uh, the holy Sikh Baba Uttam Singh was uh, requested to issue out appeals for surrender. Initially, the response from the terrorists who were inside was Khalistan Jindabad. By 15th May, that is three days after the operation was launched, was sought after for numerous killings in Delhi. He stepped out with arms raised, joined by his wife and brother, but soon consumed cyanide and died on the spot. With repeated appeals for surrender, more men came out of the rooms alongside the Parikrama with their arms raised, as you can see in the slide in front of you, and rifle sung. In a surprise move, they quickly did an about turn. Hereafter, there were no more ceasefire, only ultimating, ultimating, ultimatum to surrender was given with timelines. Finally, on 18th May, following waving of the saffron podcast through the windows, 46 terrorists, they surrendered. Two trying to flee were shot and two died after consuming cyanide. In all, 20 terrorists were killed. So, Delhi was the media, national and international. So, therefore, since everything was coming live from there, there was hardly any scope for any misgivings or any rumor mongering. Post Black Thunder 2, uh, by and large, the, I think the most important change was the denial of it not only deprived the terrorists of the physical preserve of the Golden Temple and other Gurdwaras, the unstated religious sanctity which was being achieved by using Gurdwaras as safe heavens, that finished. And, uh, well, uh, despite the tremendous success of uh, Black Thunder, really, for example, when I say military, it could be the armed forces or the uh, CAPF, in some of the adjoining districts, which were equally affected, like Gurdaspur and Firozpur, despite all the intelligence inputs which were there, uh, this was not undertaken. And so therefore, from these districts, particularly the Gurdwaras, they were able to fan out to neighboring Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, Jammu, Kashmir, and Delhi, etc. And neither was the pressure sustained on the terrace after the Black Thunder 2. As a result of which we see uh, that the like Babur Khalsa, Khalistan Commander Force, all, you know, slowly taking shape. And as a retaliation to Black Thunder 2, a number of, you know, uh, retributory actions by terrorists took place. They are flashed on the slide in front of you, primarily targeted against migrant labor and some markets in uh, various areas. So, so that is the history that we have seen starting from the beginning coming to the Black Thunder 2. So I will stop here now and uh, close this presentation. Early days to Black Thunder 2 and 
in the next session, that is, I intend to do it on next uh, Wednesday, we will take it from Black Thunder to how the situation declined, how it was recovered, and eventually this terrorism came to an end in 1993. So, so there are plenty of lessons. I will do a complete analysis of the entire thing in the next session uh, next time. The important takeaways as you close, as I close today, I think one, I repeat what I said, how domestic politics was exploited by a hostile neighbor to threaten the national integrity in such a sensitive state of the country you have seen, one. Two, how complete neglect of the terrorist activity because of political advantage which was being taken by both